welcome again to Scholars in a Bar. How you doing, Al? I'm doing great. I uh, have a little bit of uh, single malt, uh, Abelard, 12 year old. Uh, it's smooth with just a touch of peatiness. So Al, who's our guest today? Yeah, our guest is uh, Dr. Reginald Croquet, a very good friend of mine, who uh, is a professor in the graduate program of social work at Tulane University in New Orleans. Uh, however, in addition to teaching in the graduate school, which is his primary responsibility, he also teaches one of the most popular undergraduate courses at the university, which is a course on gun violence. And that is exactly what we are going to be talking to Reggie about today. And so I would just by starting off by saying, hi, Reggie, good to see you. I'm glad to have you with us. And uh, would you uh, tell us a little bit uh, about uh, your study of gun violence, uh, uh, especially in New Orleans, but uh, across the entire country for that matter. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Reggie Parquet. It's good to be here with you today. And uh, for the moment, I'm, I'm drinking a 7-Up. So I hope that's okay. And it's acceptable in the scholars uh, in a bar. Uh, at USM, Jimmy Buffett uh, is one of our very favorite alum. And his saying is, it's five o'clock somewhere. Mm. Right. So uh, I've kind of adopted that. <laughs> so Reggie, the seven is fine. But could you tell us a little bit about uh, your understanding of the impact of gun violence in New Orleans and across the country? Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Uh, and I will say, as far as the seven up goes, I will do better next time, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. As, as the both of you know, and as many of those who might be uh, seeing this know as well, that gun violence is a very serious problem here in our country. Uh, we know that roughly some 19,000, 20,000 people died in shootings or firearm related incidents in 2020. And that's uh, some of the highest figures over the last uh, two decades. We also know that uh, there's an estimated 73,000, 74,000 more individuals who were shot and survived. So this is a very serious problem and uh, we certainly need to bring a lot of attention to it. And in some ways, we, 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 we were hoping that we can get uh, gun violence reconceptualized as a, a you know, public health problem. We know that, that homicide is the third leading cause of death among youth aged 10 to 24 years old. And that uh, this number represents uh, actually more youth that were killed than the next seven leading causes of death combined. And there's certainly a, a major economic price that we pay for this as well. Uh, researchers conservatively estimate that uh, in our economy, gun violence costs us at least 20, 235 to 200, 240 billion dollars every single year and and a direct cost of some 10 to 12 billion dollars in direct expenses for things such as medical care or or for visits to the uh, emergency unit so i mean when you think about how serious this problem is let's put it in in terms of the context if you will about uh soldiers who were killed in the Vietnam War. Be between 1955 and, and 1975, uh, the Vietnam War killed over uh, 58,000 American soldiers. Mm -hmm. And that's actually less than the number of civilian killed with guns in the United States in an average uh, two year period. So, so this is a very, very serious problem that we, we certainly uh, need to, to bring a much, much attention to. Uh, 
but Reggie, before we get into this deeply, uh, let me kind of address a suspicion that some of our listeners or viewers may have, and that is that uh, we're, we're a bunch of three liberal anti-gun people sitting here. It's my understanding you yourself are a gun owner. Is that correct? That is correct. I think that uh, uh, for me, possession of a gun uh, has uh, two reasons. One, to uh, defend my, myself and my home and my family from intruders. And, and two, the other is, is a, a uh, kind of gun collection art, if you will. Uh, my, my father, my late father passed on to me an, a, a, an artifact, a, a, a double barrel shotgun that uh, I think may have been some uh, 80 years old. And, and I, I use that in, 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 uh, as a artifact and as a display, a display item, if you will. So yeah, for those two reasons that uh, I'm, I'm a gun owner. So getting back to the problem that you outlined, every year we're having more people killed of gun violence in the U.S. than, than died in Vietnam. Did I get that right? That, that, that's correct. O over a two-year period, yes. So what's the cause of this? Well, the, the, there are many things that would contribute to that. Uh, we can go through a litany of them. Uh, one of them is certainly uh, poverty. Uh, and as you know, here in, in New Orleans, we have a real high poverty rate, particularly among uh, African-American men in this city, uh, and as well as young men. Some estimate that the, would estimate that the uh, poverty rate for African-American heads of households might be anywhere as, as high as uh, uh, 40 to 52 percent. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to uh, support your family, provide for your family with that high level of, of unemployment and poverty. Uh, obviously, another one has to do with the educational system here, particularly in our city. Uh, we know that uh, uh, even, and I'll say this, even with the experiment of the charter school system, uh, most of the, the, the uh, minority youth are experiencing and receiving a lower quality of education. And that's been intensified and, and increased as a relate of COVID. Uh, many of the, the classes have been conducted virtually and online. And there's this assumption that all of our kids in this city have access to internet or access to a computer. And that's certainly not the case for, for poor families. Uh, so it's, it's been, you know, act, and exacerbated by, by COVID as well. So, so you talk about poverty rates, you talk about unemployment, you talk about a poor educational system. There are some other variables that I think contributed to that as well. Poor and the lack of parental, parental supervision. You know, we, we see, especially with this rash of carjackings taking place and, and uh, window smashing taking place, much of that is being done by young persons late at night when they should be at home and parents should be aware of where their children are and they have to assume responsibility for that. So are there age factors? You, you, you seem to be drawing a correlation between the age of the perpetrator of gun violence and that incident. Are, are there correlations that show that younger people are more likely to be involved in gun violence? That, that's correct. There is that, that correlation. And, and, and we know for among, uh, say, African-American between the ages, and I want you to hear this, between the ages of one and 44, you know, violence and death by, by guns is the number one killer. 
So you, you think about there is a correlation between young people and violence. And one of the reasons that is, is because, and, and what makes young people so dangerous, you know, they, uh, they react to things on the spur of the moment, simultaneously, uh, spontaneously, without giving it much thought. That's what makes them so, that age group, uh, so, so dangerous. You know, in, in, in 2019 here in New Orleans, um, what we had, we had, uh, I think 195 uh, murders. Many of those were the victims as well as the perpetrators were young people. Uh, so far, and, and, and then in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2019, there were there was 120, but so far in, in, in 2020, we experienced 195 and we're expecting that number to be exceeded in 2021. A lot of that has to do with, uh, with COVID. We know that, that the domestic violence has increased under, under COVID. That, and I might add that we've seen the gun purchases since March reach almost uh, uh, three or four million purchases. We've also seen an increase in purchase since the insurrection in uh, this year. And there were some 200, I'm sorry, some 2 million guns purchased since that insurrection. And when you have these weapons inside of the homes of people, there's a greater likelihood that gun violence will, will happen. And the thing is, children in those homes have access to those weapons and, and can put their hands on them. Many of them, many of the gun owners here don't utilize the safety mechanisms that might uh, hopefully eliminate some of that. So all, all of those things, things contribute. We have a, a, an economy here in this city that's, uh, as you all well know, that's, that's based on tourism. COVID has impacted that. You know, restaurants where a lot of young people might work mm -hmm. uh, have had to either reduce their staff or shut down because of COVID and the lack of activity. All, all of these things have contributed significantly to the gun violence situation here in, in our city. Uh, Reggie, going back to your uh, public health problem uh, proposal, if we treat this as a public health pro uh, problem, uh, the first step it would appear to me to be diagnostic. And that's pretty much what you're giving us right now, the diagnosis. Um, the second thing I think would be um, some form of treatment. And another thing that comes to mind is that not all gun violence, serious gun violence, is perpetrated by young groups of young people in the city. Uh, there's also another element of gun violence that we have to deal with in this society. And that is the gun violence that comes about um, either because of mental illness or because of some extremist ideology uh, that results in uh, mass murder. Uh, it seems to me that those two things are quite different. Am I right about that? Would you diagnose those two, two things as being uh, different? And if so, what are the two different treatment modalities, if we're going to use a public health analogy, uh, that must be employed to deal with these two things? Yeah, th those, those two things are different. But I think it's important to note that uh, gun violence, that, that's the result of, of mass shootings, uh, gun violence that's a result of uh, uh, extremist groups with extremist ideologies, those actually make up a small percentage of the gun violence that takes place here in this country. Now, what makes it 
appear to be more is because of the, the notoriety it receives in the media, the attention that we get when, when uh, the mass shootings in, in either in schools or uh, as we saw in Las Vegas, but they receive a certain level of notoriety that the day-to-day -day gun violence may not receive. So it may appear as if there's a lot more of it, but the reality is that it only represents a small portion of the total gun violence that's taking place here in our country. If, if you think about the city of New Orleans, uh, can, can any of, either one of you identify gun violence that was related to either mass shootings or to uh, extreme uh, racist groups? No, it's been I can only think of a couple of instances, but those go way back in our history. Uh, you know, there are those that from the 19th century examples, <laughs> that's way back there. Exactly. Well over 100 years ago. Exactly. And uh, there are a couple of uh, the, the, a little bit more recent, but nothing, nothing within the last four or five decades of any significance. Exactly. Yeah, there, there were some, some mass shootings uh, of, of African Americans early on in this century in our city. Uh, that, that's been well documented, but it, but in terms of the 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 uh, more recent mass shootings in this city, we don't we have not experienced that. Nor shootings and deaths that were associated with extremist groups. So those two things are different. Uh, what's the correlation between gun violence and other crime? Is is, is the gun violence taking part as part of another crime or is it just gun violence that stands alone where the gun violence is itself the only crime being committed? Most of the gun violence that takes place across this country and, and in this city as well, they're correlated to other crimes. Oftentimes it can be related to an armed robbery that, that went bad. We see in this city and across the nation that a lot of gun violence is associated with gang activities. We know that gun violence has a direct correlation with the uh, sale of drugs in this community and other communities where persons who uh, engage in that activity are attempting to uh, protect their turf, if you will, uh, from other persons who might invade. I, I, you all may not remember this, but when the housing developments in the city of New Orleans were uh, eliminated and, and replaced by some of the Hope 6 funding of the new sites that are here, well, when those housing developments, developments were dismantled, those individuals who had drug businesses going on in the projects, we refer to them uh, affectionately as the projects, they were dispersed throughout the city of New Orleans. So if they went into an area where uh, uh, drug sales and, and a drug turf was already established and they came into that area to set up their own, there, was a, there were a lot of, uh, of violence, a lot of deaths associated with that. We saw an actual spike in gun violence and gun deaths in this city when uh, those housing developments were closed and those residents were re relocated throughout the city of New Orleans. So th th those things are directly related. Uh, also, uh, when, when I say directly related, crimes such as, as uh, gun and drugs, very much related. I, I might add that uh, some of us who were working with the housing development attempted to suggest to the, the, the housing department here in the city to be very intentional and thoughtful about relocating individuals and that there should have been somewhat of an introductory, gradual introduction process where people should know that uh, what the potential outcomes might be if, if you pair up 
a, 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 an area of the city that already had established drug entrepreneurship going on and then bringing in new people who were going to establish their own, uh, there should have been an awareness of that. And, and some of us tried to work with the city of, of New Orleans uh, housing department uh, to show that uh, there might be a better way to uh, make that transition and that relocation uh, a lot safer. I, I guess you, you're sort of disabusing me of, a, of an idea that I had that perhaps there was a lot of domestic violence, that a lot of the gun violence was perpetrated toward people known by the, the person committing the crime. And you, you seem to suggest that that's a minority of the situations that we're looking at? Well, quite, quite frankly, the, the, the majority of the gun violence and gun deaths, the deaths that took place here, they happened between individuals who knew each other on some level, okay? Uh, they, they may have known each other on the streets. They may have known each other because they grew up in a certain area uh, where there was a uh, conflict or a competition for turf. And some of this was, was gang related. I, I need to really emphasize this part about gang. There, there was a long time before the uh, uh, law enforcement institutions as well as the, the city leaders acknowledged and recognized that we actually had gangs in this city. Uh, there was a long time before that recognition took place. And, and we had the opinion that, that uh, these things that were happening weren't really gang related. It was just some uh, maybe turf conflicts among a few people. But we've learned since then that, that there are gangs in this city. And, and you know, when, when these task force was set up, and I, I, you, you all probably remember when all of the law enforcement agencies, the feds, the, the, the state, the, the city, New Orleans Police Department, ATF, convened at the district attorney's office and, and sent out this uh, notice to the gang members that we're going to come to get you. You know, we're going to employ the RICO uh, statute to, to you know, uh, break this down. But before that happened, there, there was this really lack of, of belief that we actually had gangs here. And I think that impacted some of the violence that was taking place here in the city. The other thing, you know, if, if, if criminals know that they're only going to have a, a, a 36 to 40 percent conviction rate for murder or for homicide, they're not going to be so so intimidated by that, you know, that they it would prevent them from engaging in in that kind of criminal and violent behavior. It's my understanding that one of the reasons that the uh, police didn't think we had gangs, which everybody else was very well aware of for some reason, uh, but one of the reasons that they didn't think so was because we didn't have the the big national gangs such like as the Bloods and the Crips. We just didn't have those. We had our own much smaller homegrown variety were, that were probably even more insidious because there were more of them and there was less uh, less internal control. Is that correct? Have I, have I, have I read that correctly? There, there, there is uh, much value in what you said, Alan. I, I will say to you, to, to you and Mike as well that still that's not an excuse. And the reason that's not an excuse is because the level of violence that was taking place in this city that had to do with turfs, you know, uh, someone in the police department should have recognized that and acknowledged that. But we didn't. So we had more and smaller gangs who were basically fighting over uh, a limited amount of turf as opposed to some of the big nationals where you maybe only had two gangs and they'd already divided the turf up. So they weren't necessarily going after one another the way ours were. Is that a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment, yeah. One of the things that people that are opposed to gun control regulations often point out is that uh, 
criminals are going to get guns, regardless of what regulations you put on the legal purchase. Do you have any information about, of the gun violence that we're seeing, particularly as related to crime, other crimes, uh, do those guns come into that system through legal purchases or are the preponderance of those guns obtained illegally? Let me respond this way, Mike, both ways. And let, let me explain by that. The legal way, cr criminals are smart. What they will do to purchase a gun legally, they will have their girl, their girlfriends or friends who don't have criminal records to purchase guns for them. So they have access to guns legally via, as I said, a, a girlfriend or some uh, personal friend of theirs who don't have a criminal record. So they, they do that. They, they'll, they'll send their girlfriends to buy guns. They'll give them the monies to do so. And, it, and they'll gain and obtain legal guns that way. The other way is that they uh, obtain guns in many instances through theft. People leaving their cars in lock that have handguns in them. Individuals who, who uh, leave guns unsecured in their homes and, and their break-ins and people steal guns. A, a lot of guns that end up in the hands of, of, of these criminals are guns that have been obtained through uh, these illegal means such as theft. You know, and, and when, when if you look at some of the statistics regarding uh, arrests, and, and, and the handguns that were associated with the arrest or, the, or the, the violence, many of them have been stolen. Stolen from home, home, stolen from vehicles as well. So they obtain uh, both ways, Mike. And, and that's a really great question uh, because a lot of people don't realize that criminals use their their girlfriends, sometimes even their their uh, siblings who don't have criminal records to purchase guns for them legally, and they end up in the hands of these criminals, and they, they're used for illegal purposes. We we used to have, and we may still do have. You all were probably familiar with with this gun buyback program, and the gun buyback program generally was targeting individuals who would bring in a gun, no questions asked, and they'd get maybe $50 for that gun. 90% of those guns that were brought back were guns that had been stolen from homes or cars. Mm, wow. now, I'm gonna tell you all this, since I mentioned the gun buy pro uh, back program, and, and that's both locally and nationally. What the research suggests is that those programs were not at all effective. You know, one of the things that uh, strikes me uh, just about New Orleans, which uh, is a, a case study in all of this, but also New Orleans has a history of violence going way, way back. Uh, it was a rough and tumble river town almost from its inception. And uh, there used to be schools in the French Quarter that taught uh, young gentlemen how to engage in dueling. And uh, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh, young gentlemen ended up dead under the dueling oaks uh, now located in our city park. Um, you, you fast forward to the latter part of the 19th century, and I think of the kind of outburst of violence that would often occur in our historic red light district known as Storyville uh, during the 20 years of its, uh, of, of its uh, operation from 1819, 1897 to 1917. And, and you know, the, it wasn't unusual for somebody to be shot in one of the houses of Ville de Pute uh, there, right there in Storyville back then. That was a, a fairly common occurrence. Uh, so, you know, I'm wondering how our history plays into all of this, because there is a, a long-standing history. Some of it, you know, when we think about those interesting uh, type things, they're so far away 
that uh, they seem almost colorful. I mean, to the point of being, uh, oh, I hate to say it, but enchanting. Some ways I, I do, uh, a, a, as you mentioned, Alan, um, in the mid to late 1800s, uh, there were duels. But these were, were gunfights or duels or battles between men of honor. You know, if someone's honor had been uh, uh, assaulted, they would agree to a time and place uh, and agree to their weapons of choice to do. And whoever came out the winner, it's, it was presumed to believe that their honor was uh, uh, restored. So, but, but Reggie, one of the things I, I often hear from young African Americans when you, when they say, well, why did you, why did you kill that guy? And the justification is he dissed me. Exactly. I, I was going to get to that. Oh, okay. And, and, and to, you know, particularly if, if you're a member of a, of a gang, where respect is an extremely important quality. You have to respect the individual members. And you can, if you diss them, you know, that's a potential cause for you to be killed. And, and dissing can be something as simple as this. I'm gonna demonstrate to you guys, uh, and I wanna see if you pick it up. You, you, can, it, you can diss a person simply by doing this. Did y'all see it? Yeah. Or do I need to do I'm going to do it in slow motion. Okay. You can actually diss a person, Mike, by doing this. And that means you're looking them up and down as if they're not shit, right? You can lose your life simply by doing something. That's a diss. You can diss a person by accidentally stepping on their shoes. We had... Uh, a, a, a shooting in the in the French Quarter several years ago, where a number of people were killed because someone stepped on another individual's shoe, and that was considered being dissed. And that person was armed and began firing. I, I will say again that back in the in the uh, mid to late 1800s, you you would think that that the men of honor. These were gentlemen who were engaging in these duels. But today, these young persons, you know, I, I don't know that, that, that there's much honor, particularly when they, when they shoot you this way. They, they, they have these high powered weapons. So they will pass by and spray you with those weapons. And anybody that's in range of it can get hurt. So we have a lot of collateral damage. We didn't have that kind of collateral damage when gentlemen were uh, engaging in, in dues. So we have this tremendous problem. Are there solutions? Well, I think, I think there are solutions. Some of the solutions are not very popular. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> we have more than, we have more than 300 and 50 million guns in the hands of Americans. We have the most lax gun regulations of all of the industrialized countries, right? Mm -hmm. So one, there are a multitude of solutions, but they have to work in concert with each other. We have to have better gun laws. Even though I own a gun, I would not at all be opposed to gun control laws and policies. We have to start there. We, we have to uh, look at how we're conducting these background checks. Uh, I mentioned that criminals get their hands on, on guns through legal means by having people they know uh, purchase them for them. We have to peel back the layers and take a much closer look at that. We have to start with the family. You know, outside of, of the school and the church, the family is the first social system that children come into contact with. So 
we have to have early identity, you know, and, and a lot of people might disagree because they'll call this labeling, but I don't think it is. We, we have to be able to identify early on when children are having problems. When problems are happening in the homes, these children most of the time will manifest those pro uh, problems through behavioral things in the classroom, in the classroom. So we have to work with families in terms of how to parent kids. We have to work with, with, with uh, uh, the schools and help them to identify kids who may need help and provide that help. We have to engage in, in evidence-based interventions, evidence-based therapy to help kids who have serious uh, mental health issues that, that result in violence to be treated. And we need to make that assess accessible to people on all levels. We have to restructure and re redefine our, our uh, criminal justice system. You know, you, you, you have a lot of times these revolving doors where people go in for uh, smaller crimes and they come back out, they go in again for a crime that was a little bit more serious and they come back out, then they go in for a game for another crime that resulted in, in violence, and they come back out, they go in for another crime that may have resulted in death and they, and they come back out again. We have to restructure how that system works. And, the other night I heard President Biden speaking on this issue and he put forth two ideas. I'd like to get your reaction to them. One is that he thought that any arrest for possession of a drug, not distribution, but possession should, at least in the first instance, route that person into a rehabilitation program rather than into a criminal jail sentence. And then the second thing he said was that when people are incarcerated, we have a responsibility for giving those people while they are in school, obviously in, not in school, but in, in prison, a, uh, an education, getting them their high school degree or teaching them a trade, such as mechanics or becoming a, a butcher or a carpenter. Uh, what's your reaction to those types of ideas? I, I agree with both of them. I think if you're caught with uh, with drugs and you're not a drug entrepreneur, that you should be treated. You know, we we saw since the opioid crisis that uh, there was a greater emphasis on on uh, reconceptualizing that kind of activity as as a, a, a mental health issue that people should be treated for. I will tell you this, you all may not be aware of this, but in my, in one of my lives, I was the superintendent of, of Louisiana Training Institute in Baton Rouge, which was the largest juvenile correctional facility in the state. One of the things that I knew from the research was that the more educated a young person was, the less likely he or she would engage in delinquent or criminal activity. And I was able to get from uh, LSU and from Southern in Baton Rouge, and I want you to hear this, four four-year full-time scholarships. And these were for kids who were gonna be at that facility until their 21st birthday, but who had either earned a, a GED or a regular high school diploma. Because education is important. So I was sending kids years ago before it was even popular, kids who were incarcerated to LSU and to S Southern and Baton Rouge. They, they would, they would, we would drop them off at the university. They would function there as a regular student. And then we'd pick them up and bring them back to LTI. A lot of, I caught a lot of criticism for that. I had people calling the governor and saying, what in the hell is Parquet doing? He's sending murderers and armed robbers sitting in the classroom next to our daughters. Well, we weren't sending murderers and, and, and you know, armed robbers. We were screening these people. Some of these kids graduated 
there's a CPA in this city right now, I would never mention his name, that went through that program. Had he not gone to that program and, and gotten a, a degree, I guarantee you he would be in Angola right now. So having an emphasis on education is very, very important, even if you're incarcerated, even if you're incarcerated. Maybe especially if you're incarcerated. <laughs> And, and, and doing what was right for this kid was letting him finish school. Ultimately, that's what we want, isn't it? Absolutely. So if you were to have to codify what you would suggest as policy that the nation could follow to address this, what would be the two, three, four key things that you would have on that list? Okay. One of them, uh, I would have a policy that that reduces the the access to all of these arms that exist, and particularly handguns. Number two, I would begin looking at young people early on in their lives to see if there may be some issues that could potentially lead them on the trajectory of, of gun violence and, and, and hopefully not even death, okay? having an early identification process. I would make available to young people at an early age, uh, evidence-based treatments and interventions that would help them uh, develop a pro-social uh, belief system that, where they would not be thinking about engaging in that kind of activity. I would certainly provide parenting skills a lot of these parents are children themselves and they don't know how to, to deal with our, our parent children. They would have to be involved in parent training. Uh, most, of the, most of the incidents, particularly crime and delinquency among young people, take the, it takes place between the hours of 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Even though we're in an era of COVID, I, I would try to provide programs to these kids to help occupy their time in positive ways. Even if I have to buy a, a, a computer for them and, and pay X number of dollars for, uh, to have internet access for a month, for a year, in the long run, those kinds of investments will pay off dividends. You know, th those are some of the things that, that I think we should do. And, and as a community, the community has to be engaged in this process. We, our biggest mistake is when we put all of the emphasis and responsibility on the police department. That's wrong. That can never, that will never solve problems. We don't have enough policemen in this city to monitor the number of blocks and square miles that we have here. Now, when I was coming up, I don't know if y'all were coming up and heard this, but when I was coming up, there was a term called door, door poppers. I don't know if y'all ever heard of that before, a door popper. Now, a door popper was this. We, we, we had doors at the time. These were like screen doors that had the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, little connection. I forgot what you call it now. But mm -hmm. when you do open your door, it, would, it was a, a metal thing. It would pull your door back and it make a popping sound. Now, in our, back then, if somebody in your neighborhood was doing something, somebody in your neighborhood saw them doing something. Th these were people who would open their doors to look at and see what was going on. And you hear that door pop. We need, my point is, we need more door poppers, door poppers in our community people who will see crime and say something about it. You have to see it and, and say something about it. Crime exists in a lot of ways because people in the community accept it. They're afraid to do something about it. If, if you have that kind of community uh, involvement, uh, would you then also go along with a, more of a community policing model where the community can rely that there are officers who are present within, are in the community itself, 
officers who they get to know and who get to know them. So that the door is always open for the police themselves to receive the necessary information from the people in the community because they're trusted. And I think one of the problems that has been, and I know it's true in New Orleans and I think around the country is that very often the police are not trusted. And if the police are trusted, if you feel like, I know Officer Johnson, I know Officer Smith, and uh, they know me, and I trust them. Uh, that would, would be beneficial, a kind of community policing model in terms of really getting to know the people in the community and working with them. Let me say this, uh, Alan, I agree with you. Trust is at the core of any uh, community police relationship. It, it has to be at the core. Uh, you, you know, think about this. The police department here in New Orleans and in many other cities throughout this nation, they are the only social service system that's in our community 24 hours a day. The only social, and I'm going to call them a social service agency because they're, they're supposed to serve and protect. They're the only ones that's in our community 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But it's one of the most distrusted agencies in our communities as well. So we have to build trust. And, and there's reason for, for some of these agencies, uh, th these police agencies to not be trusted. We know that- yeah, If the people who you are supposed to serve and protect don't trust you, you got a problem. Right. Because think about it, some of these members of the police department, they're, they're weeding them out now, are very much connected with the criminal elements of this city. You know, sometimes, and I remember working in, in, in direct contact with individuals who lived in these housing developments, they were literally afraid to tell the police about crimes because the police would tell the criminals that they ratted on them, you see. If you think about the number of crimes that were committed by policemen, policemen used to go around stealing people's drugs and, and then putting them back on the street for sales. Like I said, we're weeding out a lot of those kinds of characters, but those things happened and they resulted in a, a lack of trust between the community and the police department. But you know, I go back to the days of Officer Friendly. And as you were saying, Alan, Officer Friendly was a guy that would walk the streets, come to your house, knock on your door, letting everybody know who he was. And, and then have candy was, for the kids. And candy for the kids, yeah. You know, we need we need some some more officer friendlies. Gee, looking at this as a whole, are you on balance, optimistic or pessimistic about our ability to get this under control? Well, I, I, I can only be one way, uh, Mike. I can only be optimistic. And I'm going to do my part in every way that I can to help achieve the hope for our outcomes. I want to encourage everybody to do their part as well. And I will tell you again that that Crime can only be tolerated in places and spaces where people tolerate them. They can only exist where, where it's tolerated. This isn't a good example, but I, I, I have, I'm teaching this guns and gangs class this semester, and it's always been one of the largest on Tulane's campus. And I, I have uh, several students in that class who are from China. Now, I understand the context and the situation in China, but this young lady, when we were talking about some of this stuff, she said, you know, we don't have that problem where I live. We just don't have it. You know, I don't think we have to be extreme as some of the conditions are in China to achieve that, but we can achieve a place in a space where we don't have it because we don't tolerate it. Mm -hmm.